Hello, everyone, and welcome to Irenicast. On the first and third Tuesday of every month, we bring to you our perspectives on theology and culture from a post-evangelical lens. Thank you for joining us for another conversation to provoke your progressive Christian imagination. This week, Alan and I had the pleasure to sit down with Jamie Wright, author of The Very Worst Missionary book and blog. In addition to writing her blog, she also travels widely to speak in support of groups working against human trafficking and other issues concerning human rights. Alan and I had a wonderful conversation with Jamie, and we are excited to share it with you. But before we do that, I want to let you know that if you stay tuned at the end of the conversation, uh, there'll be a little bit of an outro music, and then I'll come back in and I will let you know how you can enter into a drawing to get your very own copy of her book, The Very Worst Missionary. Uh, So without any further ado, let's get into our interview this week with Jamie Wright. So Jamie, welcome. I I feel like we should welcome the world's worst missionary to the world's (laughs) worst sound recording studio. This is a great studio. This is a legit. There's blankets everywhere. (laughs) (laughs) We're in the cry room in the back of my sanctuary. I think it's appropriate. Yeah. (laughs) tried to dampen the noise a little bit with some blankets so hopefully it's comfortable have you had worse uh recordings in worse places um or can we actually claim that title uh, no the, no you can re- you claim both best and worst because i haven't done any like in-person interview well have i actually i probably have i just don't remember you do I've a done lot so of stuff many. on like online or something yeah, I just Skype. Off yeah. In the office well this is our first inter yeah. in-person interview in fact this is only the third time in the Wait, history really? of our show we've, we've that a we've been in the same room oh really because we i oh. live down south a little bit further right so we usually do skype and stuff uh-huh. i love it i mean i i like this like this is more natural and easier to right i don't know it's just easier conversation so mm-hmm. but normally it's yeah like online and then i have to know like ahead of time like if they're doing Skype, I'm like, is this with video? Like, do I have to put on pants? <laughs> do I have to wear clothes? Like, what? Because I'm always like not pre- not prepared. If they're like, okay, turn your video on, I'm like, oh, f- <laughs> I just didn't know. It makes you uncomfortable so. to talk video chat with strangers. I'd rather on the internet. no. I mean, I'd rather do like video than audio, or mm-hmm. and rather do live than video. Like, it's right. you know, like it's just easier to have a conversation with people when you're face to face with them. Right. We recorded like 100 episodes without video, and then mm-hmm. the second we did video, we realized we were missing something huge. Right. Yeah. Oh, Visual God. cues. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Big. Because we were trying to save the <laughs> the bandwidth and all that stuff right. to make sure the audio quality was good. And <laughs> anyway, anyway, it worked out. I, um, first of all, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Uh, I read the book, and I just got to say, you had me at literary dump on your soul. <laughs> <laughs> that was the first paragraph. <laughs> I thought that was just maybe laugh out loud. I was oh. uh, I was wonderful, and it was a great tone setter for just the rest of the book, uh, nice. as far as your. Just approach to, I mean, it's said all over the uh, the recommendations and everything, but, you know, just your no-nonsense approach to, I'm just yeah. going to tell it how it is and where he, where I'm at. I felt like in the intro, I really needed, I just wanted to, like, set the bar super low <laughs> so that I could just be free to just, you know, write garbage for the rest of the book. <laughs> so I, I probably spent more time on the intro to this book than any other part really? of it because I'm like, how low can I set the bar? Like, how how disappointed can I prepare people to be? You and spoke to all of the youth group kids I ever worked with who apologized <laughs> for everything ahead of time. I know, right? I'm so me. sorry. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so yeah. sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Pre apologizer. It's a it's a definitely a thing. Yeah. yeah. It's a condition of growing up evangelical, I think. I didn't grow up evangelical. Well, that's so right. right. That's <laughs> true. You did not. You for came some of into it, it. It's just a condition. <laughs> <laughs> I actually loved that uh that part of your book where you kind of contrasted your past with uh, your husband's past because he had yeah. grown up in evangelicals and yeah. you hadn't. Yeah, we had a really it's different, insightful. yeah, different kind of path to get there, but I guess mm. we both kind of ended up there in the end. So, so along the same lines, um, you talk kind of over and over in the book about owning your own story, like it being a journey to own who you are mm-hmm. and to own what you even have the right to say mm-hmm. or not to say. Mm-hmm. And uh, do you feel like you're finally there yet? Like you 100% own who you are and what your story um, I mean, I'm super comfortable with who I am, like in general, like, I don't know if that's a weird question. <laughs> are you know, comfortable do, with who I you know. are? I mean, do I own who I, I mean, I own my story. I, yeah. I feel like, I feel like a lot of freedom to say what I think and to be wrong <laughs> and to kind of say, this is why I am the way I am or how I got here. And here's the value and the journey. Um, not not to say that we should perpetuate the same things that created me on other people, but to say I can appreciate it and not, you know, I'm not like angry at God because I didn't have an awesome childhood or any of that. Like I, I go, it wasn't great. I wouldn't do it to anybody else, but I'm, I'm 
glad to be who I am today. And um, so, yeah, I feel like I, I, I own who I am. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of people in our community who would relate to struggling to kind of own your story and mm-hmm. write your own story because mm-hmm. that's, that's a part of what, what we've been through is a community where you're not allowed to do that, mm-hmm. where you're supposed to shove a lot of that down. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the lie. That's like an evangelical lie is that Mm -hmm. like you receive Jesus and then you are, I mean, we, they use language like cleansed and changed and, you know, when in fact your journey is still there and all everything that got you there is still there. It still exists. It's still part of the the process, but we think that we're supposed to like become someone else instead of becoming fully who we are in light of who God created us to be, you know? One of the things I really appreciated about the book was typically people will write like a memoir or an experience about their story, and then they'll universalize the moral that they receive from that story and impose it on the reader, impose it on mm-hmm. everyone else that's there. And I really appreciated how you wrapped it up with this idea of, I believe in some sort of sovereignty of God. I believe that I make my own decisions, and I don't know where that line is or where it's crossed, mm-hmm. and I'm fine with not knowing. And mm-hmm. I thought that that was a really – freeing thing um, that I think took me years to get to that point, right? In in a certain context. And uh, I, I just really appreciated the way that you did it. But I also realized like that was five years, a long time in Costa Rica. And I was wondering like, what, what was your thought process in terms of what you would include and what you wouldn't in terms of how, how you, how you were piecing together your story for the book? Yeah. Um, gosh, the thought, pro- there was no thought process. It was just like <laughs> writing, writing, writing. And, and it just sort of ended up becoming what it was. I, I never intended to write a memoir. Like mm. I didn't, the book that I pitched to my publisher was not a memoir. <laughs> it was like, here's my wacky ideas about God or what. I mean, I thought I was going to write like essays and um, like loosely related s- stuff. But really, as I wrote, there was two questions that I really felt like I needed to answer. Um, I think a lot of people expected me to really dive into like a book about missions. Like here's all everything that's wrong with missions and here, you know, I maybe even wanted me to tell them how to fix it, which I have no idea how to do that. But um, I just felt like as I wrote, there were these two big questions that I get a lot um, in the context of people asking me about my missions experience. One, one is, you know, how are you so brave? Like, how do you say the things you say? How do you get away with it is the way a lot of people will phrase it. How do you get away with saying these things? And the other is, uh, who do you think you are? Like, (laughs) who do you think you are to say these things? Who do you think you are to question all of these well-intentioned, these good people that go all all over the world doing these great things or to question the results or to whatever? And um, so I just felt like before I could really do a deep dive into missions and that my five years abroad and whatever, I really want to answer those questions. And so it ended up becoming this memoir of like, this was, this is the journey that got me to this space. Um, you know, these are the the things that sort of created who I am and make me this person that just says whatever and doesn't care. And I don't need your approval. And, um, and here's why. And then like, who do I think I am? Is just like, nobody, it doesn't matter who I am, but that doesn't mean that my opinions are invalid. <laughs> um, and so you know, kind of like diving in thinking I was going to write this book about missions and having it become a memoir, it sort of limited like what I was, what I could write about missions because the missions is only like three, a third of the book, right? Mm-hmm. you know, like it's only like kind of that last section. Um, and so I really just try to choose the funniest, <laughs> um, most explicitly like or most blatantly obvious stories from my time abroad like that just said here's some weird shit that happened and here's why it made me ask these questions you know <laughs> right so it was kind of um it kind of made it easier because yeah five years is a long time and there was so much to take in and so much to then spit out in this book but i had such limited space that i was like oh i'm just gonna pick the very best examples right you so we, we got, i don't know anything about the book writing process so were you given like a a limited number of pages or like what are the parameters that they, so it's so, I don't know. It's not confusing, but like when you, I sold a proposal, like I I pitched a proposal, so I didn't sell like a manuscript. It Mm -hmm. wasn't written yet. And so when you sell a proposal, you tell them like, it's going to be, you know, 60 to 70,000 words. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know how many, yeah. yeah, no idea how many pages that is. No idea. I mean, I didn't at the time. Um, and then what you do is you give them, you know, 70,000 words, and then they tell you which 20,000 are terrible, and you take those ones out. Oh, nice. Okay. <laughs> so I think the book ended up being like maybe 55, 56, I don't know. So it's, the, yeah, it's kind of like a length. They just say, this is the length that we want. These are, and I'm not 
like organized or academic. So I think a lot of authors are really good about like, here's my outline Mm -hmm. (laughs) with a summary of every chapter. And I'm not like that. I was like, well, we'll see what happens. (laughs) (laughs) Early on in your book, you talked about someone calling you a bad Christian. Mm -hmm. And I think you call her like the mother of all church church ladies. ladies. (laughs) Yeah. And you said you wrote a letter, but you never gave it to her. And then you give us that the content of what that that letter would have been in the book. Is this book just an elaborate way to actually deliver that letter to her? (laughs) Yes. This book is just a giant middle finger to all the church ladies. Do Um, do you, do you write with them in mind anymore? No. And I never, I mean, I don't, I, I don't really know that I write with anyone in particular in mind. I just like, I'm like, oh, this is on my, this is in my head. I'm just going to spit it out. Like, I'm not like, I'm going to show somebody. <laughs> like, I, I just don't care. Um, I, I think the thing that I write with is um, sort of a compassion for other people that, like, I know other people are going through this stuff. I know other people are having these experiences and having these thoughts. And um, I happen to be able to put them into words in a certain way. And it's I think it's helpful for some people. And so, you know, just to be able to say, this is my experience and have people go, oh, my gosh, <laughs> that is that I get that is, I think, probably what I have in mind when I'm writing. That's one of the the biggest gifts of this book. I've run into so many people all over the place who who have been told exactly what you were told. Like, who are you? Mm-hmm. How dare you? Mm-hmm. Like, who do you think you are? You don't have the right to speak what what mm-hmm. you're experiencing even. Right. And, which uh, is such bullshit. I mean, it's just it such is. garbage. Like, is. that is a lie from the devil. I don't know. <laughs> from yeah. somebody. It's it's a lie. Like it, it, your opinions are valid. They might not even be right. You might not even be right. But guess what? You still get to say what you think. It's not that mm-hmm. big of a deal. And I, and I think that's what that's what I would offer anyone who wants to read this book. Like, here's someone doing that. <laughs> right, right. And guess <laughs> what? I see lived. What it looks like, <laughs> yes. Yeah, you lived. Yeah. And it seems to be more of you know you talked earlier and then you talked in the book about this idea. Well, how are you going to solve it? Where are the solutions that come with that? But I think that that's part of the solution, right? Is expressing that longing and frustration because reading between the lines of that is, but there's got to be an answer, Mm -hmm. right? There's Mm -hmm. a hope, like we're moving towards something. There's got to be, there's got to be an answer. I know someone's going to, but no one will feel like they're emboldened to come up with that answer if there's no one speaking out and just saying, here it is. Yeah. You you said you don't have to have the answers before you deconstruct stuff, right? Totally. To just call something out. Right. You don't have to know what the answer is. And we use that in church to silence people. Like we say, you know, don't complain unless you have solutions. (laughs) <laughs> right. Well, guess what? I don't know how to solve a lot of things, but I can say they're wrong. Right. I think like, that's triggering. Oh, gosh. Faster. Oh, gosh. So, but yeah, like it's it's really easy. There's lots of things in the world that happen that I don't know how to fix them, but I can go, oh, there's, you know, there's something wrong with my car. Don't know how to fix a car, but I can go to a mechanic and say, guess what? My car's making a weird noise. Since you've written this book and started having these conversations about missions, and especially Christian missions in the world, um, has anyone offered answers? really compelling answers to the whole thing? Um, Really compelling answers? No. I mean, I think it's a huge, it's a big broken machine and I don't think there is one answer. I think it's very like nuanced and there's a lot of subtleties that need to be addressed. And, you know, like most, like most big issues, there's, you could literally take, look case by case and find strengths and weaknesses all over the place. So there is no, I think one thing, but uh, I mean, truly, I think, I have so many ideas, right? Like I could fix it. I mean, but well, the ideas you float is burning things to the ground. <laughs> that's the, <laughs> that's the, no, idea. Number one is <laughs> light it on fire and, things, and watch it burn. Ju- just for people who may not have read the book and are listening to this podcast, you talk about like the fa- false gospel of North American Christian missions in the world and how it's a kind of like a billion dollar enterprise. I don't know if it's a billion, B- billions, billions of dollar yeah. enterprise mm-hmm. that's doing things all around the world mm-hmm. uh, in the name of Jesus, in the name of the church. Mm-hmm. And not doing billions of dollars worth of good yeah, all over the world. Just We just send North Americans everywhere to do whatever they want. But it feels good. <laughs> it feels <isn't> so <laughs> good, right? It feels it makes me happy in my heart. I mean, there's just, yeah. And then we use all these like dumb cliches and platitudes to say, you know, well, it, did, it, it, it helped me more than I helped them. Or, you know, right. I just, it was so inspiring to see the joy that poor people have. Or I, it just made me realize how blessed I am in the U- to live in the U.S. or whatever. Like all these things that just don't, if you really think about it, don't justify billions of dollars and hundreds of thousands of travelers and all you know the stuff that we're doing. But um, I don't know. We had we had to think about it because we've led so many short term missions trips. Yeah. In our respective youth groups, being mm-hmm. youth pastors mm-hmm. all over the world. I did it too. 
Uh, yeah. That's what I did in high school when mm-hmm. I was a high school student all the mm-hmm. way until now. And and again, there there can be value there. It's not like it's not just like I said, you know, I grew up a certain way and had a certain experience that created who I am and I'm grateful for that, but that doesn't mean that I get to say, well, everyone should experience this. Right. Like I can go, well, that, you know, it, it worked out for me, but I don't think every 17 year old girl should get pregnant. Right. right? Like <laughs> that worked out for me. It worked great. I have You're a great kid. You're officially going to say that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes. No regrets, right? No regrets for having that baby mm-hmm. and raising it, you know, but like, does that mean that we should just keep encouraging other people to do this? No, it doesn't. And so to say, hey, we, we maybe did these things and, and maybe for some people they had, they were impactful or maybe they were good, but it doesn't really justify saying, well, we're just going to keep doing it no matter what. And you you leave no stone unturned when it comes to kind of deconstructing some of the short-term mission stru- trip stuff. For instance, in the middle of reading your book in the back of my mind, I was like, well, at least I built some houses. <laughs> and then you mm. get to that point and you're like, well, technically that may not have been helpful for a community. Right. Right. Yeah. Because you could say, well, at least I emasculated some grown men (laughs) because I was a teenager and I built their house for them. So they ran away from their family. Like, Or I took the business from local businesses and contractors. Mm -hmm. Uh, That seems very specific. I mean, I'm assuming (laughs) that (laughs) that is something you saw firsthand or Uh, it it, it happens. Absolutely. Like if you if you go through any I mean, well, yeah. Maybe right. think about that. Think about like the groups of people that you brought together when that you were, as you're like mm-hmm. these teenage girls and their moms and you take them to Lowe's and you get them all a hammer and they're get, have their, their matching t-shirts. Then we take them down to Mexicali to build a shack, which is a family's third shack in two years because they're just we just keep building them a new shack. And in the pictures, you see like the the awkward smile of the mom and then the the uncomfortable children and all of the teenage girls and the like scrawny boys that built their house and then no dad. Well, you see, you see that stuff. I mm-hmm. think for most of us, we don't, we just think, Oh, they're just a different culture than us. Oh, there's some <laughs> sort of distance. <laughs> right. Right. But you right. spent time with people enough to get to know them for who they yeah. are. Yeah. And then you saw mm-hmm. the other side of things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and really did a lot of this dumb stuff. I mean, I worked in a, one of the poorest communities in Costa Rica um, doing like a little kids program, you know, like, mm-hmm. oh, we show up and we brought bread and banana. Like we fed these very impoverished children. I mean, these were very poor kids. You know, we'd show up and we'd feed them and we'd do coloring pages and we'd do, you know, crafts. And it was super fun. We got to know them and they knew our names and we knew their names. And I mean, it was it was cute <laughs> and it was fun. But the longer I spent, you know, going out to this community and really paying attention you know, because at first it was showing up with all those good feelings of like, oh, gosh, thank goodness we showed up with bananas for those kids today. Um, but, you know, three months later and they're like, um, how many, the, you know, five-year-olds are asking me like, how many times have you been on an airplane? And how much did your car cost? And where do your kids go to school? And I'm like, oh, well, my kids go to a very nice private school and they wear very nice uniforms and, you know, um, realizing how I didn't, how, how much I didn't want to answer those questions. Because poor people are not stupid. They, their moms had cell phones and they would like take my phone and take all these selfies. And, you know, I'd go home and I'd be like, oh, it's so cute. I have all these selfies to go through on my phone because they're perfectly adept at using an iPhone because all of their moms who were basically like welfare moms or, or prostitutes or whatever, they just like in the U.S. where you have kind of entitlement issues and handout, like the same issues with handouts and drug use and domestic violence it, it's all the, it's all there too like just it's, just right. systemic problems yes yeah, systemic problems and mm-hmm. and myself and my little white missionary friends we thought you know all we have to do is just show up <laughs> give them a banana and love them well their moms love them they didn't well, need us love, to love them. on them love on them yes yeah, sorry missionary <laughs> we were missionaries we didn't love them we loved on them oh god i hate that so yeah it just it's it's so complicated and I think for those of us that, that have walked that path and like done these embarrassing things and and aren't for those of us that aren't going to double down and like demand that people recognize how amazing it was and how helpful it was, it's very humbling. It's it's almost humiliating where you're just like, oh, this is painful to admit that I did these things right. and that I you know fetishize these brown children and, and to, to make myself feel good and our missions racist totally. Oh my gosh, yeah. If the average person, the average North American, if you say the word missions, they think about white people going to brown people. Right. That it's inherently racist. Like most of them are not like, we're going to go help 
you know, the Swedish people. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> it's just not, it's not a thing. I mean, it may be, I'm sure it is a thing because whatever, there's missions for everything. But I think that it's absolutely colonial. I mean, there's a destination vacation for everyone all yes, over the world. Yes, exactly. Really Which I'm a big fan of vacation. Like, <laughs> you, if you want to travel, go on vacation. That's what you should do. Right. But, yeah. I re- while I was reading it, because like you said, did a bunch of uh, mission strip myself. And uh, as we've been doing the show, it's been kind of a, an exercise for us and our deconstruction as we kind of just get some stuff out there and, and talk about different issues and sometimes land, find a landing place and other times not. And I feel like there's most of the corners of my experience as a youth pastor have been tidied up and dealt with and figured out like, I'll keep this from the past and I'm going to put this new thing here. But that missions trip room is still, <laughs> it's the room where I throw everything in, you know, <laughs> the <laughs> that, junk drawer. <laughs> that's right. And eventually is going to have to get, but I think this yeah. reading this book really cracked the door open on that because mm-hmm. like you said, there was great experiences. We had wonderful time with students and, uh, almost every student that, that I and my wife took on missions trips for short-term mission trip ended up going our way as far as getting out of evangelicals long-term because it gave them this sense that their world is bigger and that there are real problems in the world and all that kind of stuff. But then also like using that broken system, Mm -hmm. (laughs) uh, those are, those are difficult moments to like sift through the good and how they contributed to a, to a, to a bad system. And I think that this, uh, your story was really important that you can do that. And sometimes Mm -hmm. you, you don't have an answer. You just have to accept it is what it is. But if you were, if, if a youth pastor, a well-meaning youth pastor came to you and said, all right, I read your book. I hear it. I love it. I agree with it. I'm conflicted, but the church is making me do that. What are small things that you would recommend in terms of like, well, when you go do this instead of this? Mm. Well, I would say stop calling it a mission. Mm. <laughs> stop using missions That's language. That's Ditch really all good. Of it. Stop using all of the dumb, over-spiritualized bullshit language that we use to describe the way white people go out into the world. Like if you're going to take, if you're taking kids to give them perspective, then communicate that clearly. Like, oh, this is just to give you perspective. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that I agree with that. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't think we should use poor people to teach rich people lessons. Like, I think that's gross, but call it what it is. I think we should make people save their own money and work for their own money if they want to go places like the the kind of conglomerate we're going to come together as a church and crowdsource your travel i think is antithetical to the way of jesus i think there's things we should be crowdsourcing as the church and it's not sending middle class white people all over the world that's probably well said <laughs> you know? so if you want to go work a summer you know if you want to take teenagers require them like, oh, you need to work a summer job and save all that money. And then, you know, in September, we'll sign up for this thing, like whatever. But but the the whole we're going to send letters to your grandparents and all your neighbors and whatever. Stop doing that. That's such a gross entitlement issue. And it's so economically unfair to people who don't come from wealthy families or or moderately <laughs> comfortable families. But um, the overall, I think it's the language is one of the, the worst things that we do in missions is we just we have all this Um, these false measures like planting seeds, you know, we tell our high school students or we tell our, or the short term missionaries that even if you don't know, like, even if you don't know if you did any good, you planted seeds. That's a door prize. No, that's a participation trophy. Like we don't need to hand those out, um, have measurable, measurable results. And that speaks directly to something you say, you say, uh, just because God can use anything doesn't mean we should be doing anything. Totally. Yes. <laughs> God can an use anyone to do anything. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's why I'm here. I wrote a stupid book, you guys. Like, I get that God can use anyone to do anything. But that is the worst standard by which we should send people out into the world. I think as ministers who have worked in churches, that was probably the most triggering part for my my thing was so recognizing that there are people, especially people, the people that we choose to bless, like you speak about. You know, holding people to certain standards, re- requiring certain things, mm-hmm. and the people that we choose to bless to send to represent us, it shouldn't be just anyone. Mm-mm. And working in ministry, I've worked with a lot of pastors and stuff who, like, frankly, should not be working in ministry. Mm-hmm. We're with people. <laughs> uh-huh. Right. Where you're like, you're not actually a pastor. Like, what are you doing here? But who are you? Who I mean, are who you, Jamie, say? to say that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I certainly think all the things that you mentioned about the type of missionaries you encountered can be said of 
pastors as well. Oh, totally. <laughs> it's a, it draws a certain kind of person. I mean, sorry, guys, but no, like, no. <laughs> ministry has, it draws a certain type of person. And, a narcissistic person. Yes. That's it. That's absolutely true. Yeah. But we were just talking before this that we, we were going to – we were thinking about writing a book and calling it The Many Faces of Insecurity Ministry in America. <laughs> or just the ministry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. That is actually – yeah, yeah, I think it draws and it draws a certain type of person. And then in missions, it's almost like worse because we take the people that are drawn toward ministry that we don't want doing ministry in our own communities mm. and we send them to other communities. Like we go, oh, well, you can't even make eye contact and you eat boogers. So we're going to send you to Guatemala. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So exporting our most yes, interesting our, we, people. Our weirdos. I'll say it. We export our weirdos. And then we Isn't call the gospel them. supposed to make you weird, Jamie? I don't even know what that means. Is it? Is it supposed to make you weird? Maybe different, but yeah. Well, well, then anytime you get you know persecuted for being different or weird, then it right. solidifies it's, your calling. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we love that narrative, like oh, God can do anything through anyone. We love that. It's so comforting. It is so comforting to think that the person that goes to your church that you literally don't want to hang out with. Like you're just like, I don't want them to come over to my house. <laughs> I don't want to around my kids. Yeah, I don't want like it's so comforting to think that God still has a plan and a purpose for them. But the the problem with that is well, I mean there's many problems with it, but I think the issue behind who we send and, and why and where is that we have this thing where we think that if somebody says they've been called, we have to agree with them. Right. And pastors love this because it it lets them off the hook of doing the work of the pastorate, which is to know their people, right? It's a, it's a, your job as a pastor is to have to have, is to have, sometimes have hard conversations with people and say, Hey, you know what? You don't get to work with children at this church. Right. You're loved, yeah. you're valued, but. And there's we, a place for you and God loves you. Yeah. And there are things that God yeah. will do with and you. And as but, your pastor, I will help you find that place. Yeah. Um, but that requires knowing knowing people, like truly knowing them. And, you know, the way we run churches, they're so big. They're too big for pastors to know their people. And I just, I, yeah, I mean, I just think it's looking it's at it from the other perspective. I, I feel like it's the same way the other way around is like communities are responsible with who and what they bless. And I think we've been told so often that our voices don't matter mm -hmm. that we don't realize that like that really does matter. Mm -hmm. So getting to know pastors and saying like, hey, we as a community support you as a minister. Right. You have a direct say in that. Right. Absolutely. Or should. Yeah. Yeah. You should. And you should know. And even at some point, you may have to, as a community, say, hey, we don't think you should be our pastor. <laughs> right. I mean, like, there are so many bad pastors out there. Yeah. Ugh, yeah. It's all, it's so messy. But honestly, I kind of love it. And I love talking to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I wanted to ask this. So, this is kind of the, I guess you can call the ecumenical question the different churches, different denominations. You said you went to <laughs> somewhere in your book. A country that has seminaries for God's sake, like people who are trained in ministry mm -hmm. in their own communities for their own own country. Um, was the missions program that you worked with like multi-denominational? Mm -hmm. Did they look at like Catholics as Christians or were they as people that needed to be saved or something like that? Um, the the organization that I went with did look at Catholics as Christians. Okay. I mean, I would imagine. I mean, the reason I asked. To be honest, like, I never asked. That's how I ended up in a really? Catholic country. Like I got there and I was like, there are bumper stickers of Jesus on every car. <laughs> like the the buses, yes. the public buses, every bus has like a bumper sticker of G, like Jesus with a crown of thorns. I'm like these, who? What am I doing? It like the the landmark in every community is the church. That's how you know where to go. They'll say like 50 meters northeast of the church, and you're like, oh okay. Like there is so. So I don't know. I don't know that the organization that I with really looked into it. I mean, they were very much of the the mindset like, we'll go where you you know go where you want to go, and we'll send you. Hmm. All you have to do is raise the money. Because some of the rhetoric I hear in churches, well, like for me personally, uh, we would send people to countries that are largely Orthodox Christian, mm -hmm. and like the unspoken thing would be like, there's like no Christians there, but we would just be discounting what. Well, Christianity is already there and, you know, culturally contextual. Right. Um, and I remember going to seminary and being like my brain being exploded that half the Christians in the world are Catholic. <laughs> half of, the, of Catholics are charismatics, actually. So like charismatic Catholics. One quarter are Orthodox and one fourth of all Christians in the world are all Protestant denominations put together. Mm -hmm. And so it makes me wonder, like most missions, how they interact with the other Christians who are already there and what I think that's they like. Just ignore them. I mean, I think there's there's some territorialism. Like there's some there's some I think 
infighting sometimes. And I think there are a lot of missionaries that wouldn't consider Catholics really like true Christians. But like, what the fuck? I don't I look at it's hard for me to look at the evangelical church and be like, oh, there's a Christian in there. <laughs> like there's one in there, that building full of 5,000 people. Are you on saying that morning. American evangelicals need to be missionized? Yeah. Yeah. Bring, from- bring the Ugandans here to to mission, missionary them, missionish them. I don't know. But yeah. I, it's just such an absurd thing for us to uh. decide. Like, I don't know. I don't know. There, there are seminaries in virtually every country in the world. Church, there are churches. Right. There are, and that's the other thing about missions is if the mission is to grow the church, then we are sending all the missionaries to all the wrong places. Right. Right. Because, but nobody wants to go on a mission in Iran because they'll get their head chopped off. Like nobody wants to do that. Right. Nobody wants to go to the dangerous places or the places where they aren't welcome. They want to go to vacation spots where the Catholic church is flourishing and, um, and, and just kind of like, whatever, do a skit on the corner. <laughs> so. It is odd when you put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> that is a lot of money to accomplish something very specific. Yep. Was there a lot of work with local churches and pastors? Yeah. I, I mean, I would say the organization that I was with was very connected mm-hmm. with local churches and pastors. It was, in my opinion, and here's the thing. I love some these some of the people that I worked with are still there. They're still missionaries, they're still on the ground, they're still doing this stuff. You know, this is not to like hurt them. <laughs> um, but they're it's very colonial. Like they're very much importing the white or North American evangelical church into these, like, here's how you do it. You know, it's Latin America. So like we would go to church and our pastor would run in, you know, during the third song, throw his keys on a metal chair and run up, like run up sweating up to the the like grab a mic and be like oh sorry i'm late again you know, i mean this was like a latino pastor who's just that's tico time like they're always late for everything and so you have like the north american missionaries you know kind of kind of swooping in and just being like oh you got to be on time you should be there five minutes early and you, here's the ri- here's the rhythm it's you know th- two songs and then the announcements and then another song and then a prayer and like very much like this kind of comfortable evangelical thing that we're used to in the North American suburbs. Um, I saw them like the leadership on my team pushing that into the the Latino church and kind of it was pretty gross. I mean it was very much like I am your mentor. I am here to show you how to be a pastor. Right. But they were already pastoring and they were already leading their people and their people loved them and this sense that like church needs to start on time <laughs> was it was just odd to me, like because it was our value, not theirs. So do you think churches in North America should just dump money instead of sending people just like identify people who are already pastors in those churches that may have needs and just send them a big check and be like, here you go. Do what you need to with it. But why? Why do we need to dump money into them? Right. Like, why? Why wouldn't they, we want their communities to support them? Right. Because that's that builds that intimacy and trust and accountability. I mean, it's not this like long distance church building thing is not healthy. I think part of what drives missions for what I've seen is a guilt over the raging inequality between like the richest in the world and the, Mm -hmm. and the least. Yeah. And it does make us feel better to write a check is an easy way to feel like I did my part. And then it makes us feel better about our own lifestyles. Right. We go, Oh, I'm trying, I'm elevating other people. I'm elevating as long as I'm working to elevate other people to my lifestyle then I've done my part as a Christian and I don't have to change my lifestyle. Like I don't have to change the way that I spend money as long as I'm giving some money to someone else to live the way I live. I think that's a big part of it. But. Hmm. Yeah. I think it's, you know, it's, it's just like any other systemic problem mm-hmm. at a certain point. You're like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> right. It's so paralyzing. Right. Too. You yeah. just go, okay, I'm just not going to do it. And that's where you shut the door on the missions thing. Uh-huh. Just go, it's too big. There's too much wrong with it. There's where would I start? Where would I, how would I start sifting through this? And so you just close the door on it and go, I'm just going to focus on other things. And I don't think there's really, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> right? right. There's plenty of other things to focus on. For sure. But when you do try it, like really start to parse it out, it can be really overwhelming. And you just go, I don't know where to start. I don't know. I don't know what to do differently. But but what you see is that it's not fixing all the problems in the world to send these people around the world. And it's creating a lot of problems. The, yeah, creating yeah, more problems. Creating a lot of problems. Solving. And, mm-hmm. um, I saw a picture, I think, so I think this is what it is. A picture of you with Benjamin L. Corey, Matthew Paul Turner, mm-hmm. uh, Christian Pyatt. Mm-hmm. And I think Zach Hunt was yep, in there too. Zach was no there, way. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, It's funny because I read some of their blogs back in the day mm-hmm. and yours as well when they were being written and uh 
you were all on a bus doing a tour of like Jordan World Vision or something? Or? No, it was Jordan. It, that was actually a really kick ass trip. It was um, we were on t- a tour with the Jordanian Tourism Board. So it was like five star hotels and like King Herod's tour bus all through Jordan, seeing all these amazing Middle Eastern historical sites and places that Jesus did cool stuff. And like it was it was a really cool trip. But like Primo, like, oh God, it was amazing. We rode <laughs> camels through the desert. I mean, it was just we stayed the night on a Bedouin camp. It was so, so cool. So how did you guys land that? How did you? Uh... Who inv- ben invited me on that trip. He he had some connection. He he leads it or he partners with okay. the tourism board or something. Did you do work with like humanitarian groups like going? I do. Yeah, I yeah, still do. And in do. fact, oddly enough, I guess I'm still processing this in my own mind, but um, I am going on a trip. A second trip with World Vision this year. Very cool. <laughs> well, we'll see. Um, I went on a trip with them a few years ago. And they didn't disinvite you forever? They, so. they did. They did. Because, I. well, Lynn, I was like, here's all the reasons this was not amazing. So we had this kind of like to find the relationship with World Vision. And it <laughs> sent, like, DT, I haven't uh, heard that phrase in so it, long. It, it like <laughs> sent ripples, these like ripples through all of the like major kind of but, you know, whatever, monthly, whatever, sponsorship programs, World Vision, Compassion, um, Feed the Children, all of these huge, huge organizations. That's a lot of money. Uh-huh. Well, yeah. And so, I, you know, to take these bloggers on these trips, I was probably the first blogger ever to go on any trip and come back and say, mm, it was not great. Hmm. And it wasn't. I mean, I, they what they had told me, what I agreed to go see was World Vision's typical um, – I don't even know what you call it, but they have like a system where it's like, here's where a community, you know, they they kind of get into a community, ideally get in, do this com- community development, and then they get out. And I, they were going to show us different phases of that. And um, instead, they showed us like a, a music program, which is fine. It was fine. But I, I just was like, I can't, I'm not going to ask people to support your $125,000 music program for these kids. The kids were like literally taking out their cell phones and taking our pictures, which is Again, nothing wrong with that, but that's not the mission of the church. And I just was like, I can't get on board with this. And then there were some other like super sketchy things that happened that I wrote about because that's my job. And and I was clear too when they invited me that that I might not love it and that I had a lot <laughs> of like, questions. This is who I am. Yeah, and Are I was you like, sure you want to tell and, me yeah, up. and that whatever I saw, I was going to write honestly about. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, to be fair, I was I went in really believing that I was going to see something great from them, and I didn't. That does not, however, mean that they don't do great things in parts right. of the world. So I think their courage in inviting me back is uh, is kind of inspiring. Like, I, I think that that's very brave. And I think that they must have, or I'm hoping that they have something really cool to offer people who are looking for an outlet to serve or give or whatever. So we'll see. We'll see. It's very brave of them to have me back. So I'm going to Uganda in August with them. So we'll see. That's really cool. Mm. Well, or it will be terrible. Right. <laughs> You'll find out. <laughs> but I think it's going to be good. It's good to have eyes on the inside. I mean, I I run a budget for – I've been working as a solo minister for like quite a few many years now. And whenever people ask us for money for projects and stuff, in the back of my mind are all of the ladies in my church who are widows mm-hmm. who are on a fixed income. Mm-hmm. And like you're asking for their money. Like it's it better be something that's that's frankly worth it. Yeah. Not that people are not worth it who don't have a lot of money, but like you're it's not just the church that's sending these people. It's real people who have mm-hmm. real struggles. Mm-hmm. Um, our that's society's not free of, <laughs> of problems. Cool. Well, yeah, right. People. Right. Yeah. People. Are, I mean, and that's the truth is it's the people who are really sacrificing to give that deserve that accountability from us, deserve that honesty from us. And one of the things that that really struck me or sh- that I hear I hear from missionaries all the time or people that came back from short-term trips and were like, oh, it was just awful. It was awful. We didn't do anything good. And they have this guilt because they they gathered all this money from all these people and they don't want to hurt the people that gave, right? We don't want to hurt them. We don't want them no- to know that their money didn't help anyone. Um, and so they just stay silent. But the best thing we can do is when we find, you know, we just go, okay, here was a, here was a mistake. Here was an error that we made to empower people to give their money wisely in the future, um, I think is is such a huge thing that we can do as leaders in the church and as pastors and missionaries. I mean, whoever um, is to just kind of have those really vulnerable moments of saying like, I did this thing be- because I genuinely thought it would be a good thing. And 
and I asked you for money and you gave it to me and I'm super grateful, but guess what? It, it just wasn't as good as what I'd hoped. And I want you to know because you gave. Um, I think it's kind and fair and honest, but it's hard and scary. Because if God's involved, it should all be. It's supposed to be pretty. Yeah. <laughs> if God, if God's involved, then a unicorn was supposed to shit stardust on your mission trip <laughs> or whatever. And if he doesn't, then we're like, oh no, God is dead. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like this is the question that you probably always get asked. Do you always get asked about cussing? Like every time you've done a, a conversation about books and. Not always. Was, not always. <laughs> but a lot. Yeah. A lot. A lot. Yeah. A you, lot. <laughs> you, you put out a, um, a guide to. Uh, edit your book I did. Like <laughs> so i kept getting all these like emails from people or comments online people were like oh loved your book wish i could give it to so and so but i can't because of the swears and i'm just like hey here's a neat thing that you could do um cross them out because this is the weird thing about like christian people is they will look at they they don't care if like your swear word is a fake square like if you cross the eye out of shit then they're like oh it's not bad anymore absolutely <laughs> right it's magic yeah or if you just cross out shit then they're like oh it's gone. <laughs> so if you just censor it, then <laughs> Sorry, the look on your face like that it. just says everything. That it's, right there, like yep. that's it's so funny. absurd, but it's true. It's like and a so, language purity culture, exactly, <laughs> right. exactly. So I did. I like made a little because I was like, I don't care. Cross it out. I, like I, so, I did. I I kind of made like here's a page by page guide to crossing out all the swear words in my book, so that you can give it to your whoever your pastor or your grandma or i feel grand, like that grandma. guide itself is like a prophetic <laughs> creation <laughs> like, just look at this look I at that this exists so funny like i was just like I don't... and the other thing is like if you like there people are like oh you read this book and i just i wish you wouldn't swear so that more people could hear about these ideas mm. i'm like you tell them like why do i have to be the one to tell them like if you read it and you're like oh yeah you know what there is stuff wrong with missions or oh yeah we should be more vulnerable and honest you say that I don't, it doesn't have to be me you can learn things and then repeat them. <laughs> the point of my book was that you're supposed to be able to own your story right. and speak right. your right. voice. Did yeah. you not read it? Exactly. This is not my job, you guys. Yeah. Well, full disclosure, we edit out <laughs> all that in the show, but only because <laughs> That's fine. Apple Podcasts has this – like certain countries, mm -hmm. if your show is marked explicit, they cast it yeah. out of the Apple iTunes store. Mm -hmm. So, And we have a couple of those countries, but it doesn't matter to us. Like, I don't care. And that's kind of why I yeah. ask if you edit. That's why I ask, right. like, hey, do you edit pranks? We, we just we just mute it out, but we don't yeah. edit what you say or anything. I don't like care. That. I don't. I really don't care. Yeah, you, could, the, you could restring my words to say terrible things, was, and then I would share <laughs> it, and I'd be like, "Look what these bastards did funny. to me." There's a uh, there was a I actually looked at Goodreads and I saw someone's review that was like such a great concept, but when I turned the page, there was a cuss word on the third page. And I just can't believe that someone <laughs> would dare to represent right. God in such a way or Jesus or whatever. Right? Did you miss the one on the first page? Because <laughs> <laughs> I just, you did know. you miss worst on the cover? Right? Like, did, <laughs> like, were you not warned? It's so funny. People just have hangups about certain things, and that's just not one of mine. And I love it. People are like, you know what? Someday the Holy Ghost will convict you of your language. And I'm like, mm, okay. I don't, I don't think so. This That'll is not be such like a, a special day when that happens. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because remember like when I became a Christian, and I was like, I can't swear. And I did that for 10 years. And then I was like, Holy Ghost was like, I don't worry You're about like, that. You're like, it didn't make me a better person right. for some right. reason. The Holy Spirit was like, I don't care about your swearing. And I was like, oh, okay. So. Like, Do you feel like it's heightened because you're a woman? Do you think um, certain people. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, because I get, I'll get comments like that. A lady. lady I'm like, yeah. yep, I'm a lady. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, I but really liked whatever. the way you depicted some of your childhood scenes. Uh, <laughs> my favorite line in the whole book that's been stuck with me, I don't know why, is you're talking about going to your parents' bedroom and you're mm -hmm. looking through the drawers. <clears throat> and you say it's like a preteen's paradise. There's like uh, a revolver, uh, something else. And then like uh, a year's worth of antacids. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Putting that, that part was just really funny for me. That one detail. See, you know, what? people either understand that or they don't. They, right? I don't know. It was like my dad just had this drawer full of Tums. <laughs> Totally he had like the one. rainbow one. He had the mint one. I ate them all. I ate so many tums. Like just oh, the candy. Oh, this is candy for me. That's all we want is you know unlimited tums and, and a yeah. unlocked revolver. Exactly. Like we could just all exactly. have that. And a yamaka. If you <laughs> those well, three right. things are just you know that's all you need in your childhood. It's so I, yeah, I just pictured you. You're posing with the menorah or whatever, yes, and the yeah. gun held high. Oh yeah, yeah. Jewish Charlie's angel. I did that. I did that stuff a lot. I was such a weird kid. <laughs> I mean, and that's why you ended up on the mission field. Exactly. Right? <laughs> that's she's the weirdo. So true. 
Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about, we kind of mentioned it earlier. You, at one point, it's kind of like a throwaway line and you move on, but you do reference this. You talk about a complicated God versus a really like easily understood God. And uh, in one whole chapter, you talk about like practical magic, mm-hmm. the mixture of divine, human, chance, all that kind of stuff. I think uh, when I think about missions and when I think about my language about it, we used to say stuff like God's will a lot. Oh, this is God's will. And mm-hmm. It's kind of like a rubber stamp to, mm-hmm. to whatever we do. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you how do you imagine in your life and in your experience God interacting with the world or us? Or how does that how does your practical magic take yeah. flesh out? I, I don't imagine it. I don't know. <laughs> I don't I try not to think about it because I literally I have no idea. All I know is that um as I've grown up, as I've grown like into who I am today, the more I lean into my strengths and stop trying to like fake it or you know be someone I'm not, the more I've learned like who I am and what my strengths are and and how to kind of wield those gifts in the world, the more those are the spaces where it seems like oh god god was in that. Yeah. Like God showed up. I mean, you could say whatever. God, God is everywhere at all times, whatever. But like those moments, those like magical moments that we we would call, you know, a God thing or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, a God moment. Yeah. There's so often this weird mix of like your whole life and everything that brought you there and, you know, some skill that you have, some capacity that you have, some gift that you are able to impart and then God, like, kind of, I don't know, drawing the right people into that mix or drawing you into the right space, the right time. I, I don't know how it all works. I just know that we are, when we're both in it, when we're, like, all in it together, that's when the most amazing things happen. Like, that's when the weird, like, life-changing, like, theology-shifting, globally uh, um, in- miraculous things, that's where those things happen. Where you're like, oh, it's a miracle. Like, God showed up or... um you know, some crazy, and I talk in the book about like these weird stories that you hear, you know, some firefighter left a wedding early, got lost on a back country road and comes across some old lady dying in a ditch. <laughs> and it's all these little weird things that you're like, oh, and then the right person with the right skills showed up and saved her life. And wow, I love that it's a you miracle. drew in the story about the kids who chased down that would be kidnapped. You know what I'm talking about? Bikes. You know I that do. story, right? And when yes. you said that, I was like, you know what? That is a miraculous thing. It is. It is and a messy, kids- miraculous thing that's just so right. cool. And you know, like the the kids that all the neighbors are like, oh, those boys are out again on their bikes and they're in my yard. And and yet they're the bold, badass kids that are like, look at this fucker. Like, we're going to chase him down because this doesn't look right. I wouldn't have done that as a kid. I wasn't that kid that was like, oh, that looks weird. I was the kid that would have been like, that looks weird. I'm going to go in the house now. <laughs> so it's just those those leanings, like when you lean into your strengths. And and when I say strengths, I do not mean like your magical Jesus juju powers. I mean like who you are, like the your innate personality, that all the your your nature and nurture, all the things that you were raised with, all the junk that kind of brought you to the place that you're at, your education, because yeah, that actually matters. <laughs> like your education, your skills, your all of it, your athletic abilities, all of it, it all matters. And when you find yourself like really leaning into those spaces and like God is there, it's crazy. It's amazing. And that's when you have those really, truly like big, big moments where you're just like, oh my gosh, like I can't believe that happened. And I'll always remember that. And, or, you know, someone's life was changed or saved or um, someone was helped or your own like heart was healed. It's just, I don't know. So I, I so call it you, practical those, magic. <laughs> those practical magic, those mm-hmm. miracles happen. Um, but for you, they're a messy mixture of both things. You can't just say this was just God. This is a combination of a lot of different things. Yeah. And just because God somehow was in it doesn't mean we lose our responsibility right. for our part in it. Right. Let's let God bring the magic. It. Let's let right. God decide if something's going to be magical and let's let us do what is practical. Like the education. Yes. Like, like you want to save, <laughs> yeah, you want to save the world? Go be a social worker. Guess what yeah. a social worker needs? A degree. But yeah, I, I mean, it's just that that mix of like, I'm going to do the most practical thing. And then it frees us from having to like deal with all the, am I called? Am I called to this? Is this God's will? Is this uh, you, like, you just don't have to worry about any of that stuff anymore. You just have to do what you are able to do. And then like, let God decide if it's going to be a miracle or if it's going to be magical or if it's going to be this like incredible moment. And the truth is, a lot of times it is. One of the things in regards to that, you use the word calling a lot throughout the book and then kind of end 
subvert it a little bit mm-hmm. by kind of bringing it together with all that kind of stuff. So when you hear the word calling now, like, does that trigger anything for you? Or have you kind of like replaced a new definition for what we were just talking about for that word? Right. When I hear it now, I wonder what the definition is for that person, right. because it's that is part of the missions bullshit language or, or Christian bullshit. language. Like it doesn't mean anything. Calling doesn't mean anything. And so wh- I'm always trying to ferret out like, well, what do you, when you say calling, do you mean, are you talking about your passion? Are you talking about your hopes? Are you talking about your lust? Are you talking about your wander, your wanderlust? Are you talking about your, like, what are you really saying when you say calling? Because there is a better word for it. And, and depending on who you are and what you're talking about, like, I'd like to know that word. <laughs> like when you say, when, you know, we hear these sweet girls and they say like, um, God just like laid it on my heart <laughs> um, <laughs> to move to whatever, you know, tiny African country because, um, I, you know, and, and so I feel called there. What does that mean? Why, why? Why did God lay it on your heart? And what does it mean that you are called to go and live there? Because the truth is I've been to dozens of countries and some of them have, have, struck me more deeply or stayed with me more intimately than others, it does not mean that I'm called to them. Do I love those countries? Absolutely. Do I feel passion for the people there? And do I want, do I wish that I could live there or whatever? Sure. There's a substitutive. So this just popped in my brain. There's a cognitive error. Um, There's a really good book called Thinking Fast and Slow. And he outlines cognitive errors that we do. Like we'll vote for a politician. We think they're trustworthy, but really they just have a strong jawline. And that's it. (laughs) Right. We we think they're trustworthy. (laughs) Yeah. It's like, oh, I have a calling. It's like, no, you just love that country. Yes. And like you care about it and you're interested in it. And And that's really cool. There's nothing wrong with that. So you're not out to wreck people's uh, experiences. You're more out to inflate their agency and their responsibility and say, hey, like this is important. Define it. If you define it, you can do so much better. You'll do so much better. Your life will be so much easier to live if you really define like who you are and what you're about and, and because you're the one language re- to it. And for me, I, that makes me the one responsible for my decisions because mm-hmm. I, I end up with a lot of resentment when I make decisions based on what I feel God is telling me to do and I don't necessarily have a lot of say in it. Right, right, which it just doesn't happen. Well, and it's perpetuated by a system that benefits from making people feel that way, right? Yep. And that's that's the big problem is it's not it's like it's we can be responsible for our own wording, but we have to recognize that that's going against a lot of the systems that Mm -hmm. we're in. But I think it's an important thing to do because Mm -hmm. you don't have a lot of leaders that are willing to overthrow their own (laughs) their own system and their own way of kind of getting people to to look past the language that they use. Right. Right. Because it benefits them. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of people getting paid. Lots and lots. I mean. A lot of people getting paid. Christianity is an industry. Missions is an industry. And, you know, the the language, the the like vague, neg- nebulous kind of meaningless language, it serves a lot of people who are getting whose lifestyles depend on it. Right. I mean, the episode we did just before this one, we talked about the idea of euphemisms and how mm-hmm. we s- softened language is used to, you know, prop up power structures and, yep. and keep people down and how important it is to say things Say what you mean. Yes. <laughs> mean what you say. Use real words. Right. To say exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So at the end of the book, you talk about kind of coming home. And um, one of the ongoing conversations for our podcast is our relationship to church here in the States. And kind of, you know, obviously both of us still being in ministry um, but certainly in hasn't way, shied us away from really right, you know, talking about it. Weird new – Places we'd never expected to be. Right. I mean, I never expected to be in a congregationalist church, and you probably didn't expect to be working with men. I didn't expect and, to be in church again after I left evangelical church. I thought it was – that was it. Um, but it's still a big part of us, and so it's hard to find where home is at. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So what is your relationship with church after that whole thing, and, and kind of what what does that look like in your life? Because it, obviously it was, it was an important part, although the glowing yeah. things that you talked most about were the community and the connections you had. Mm-hmm. And – uh Are you finding that in church or you do find that in other avenues or a little bit of Um, both? I'm not super connected to a church right now. There is a tiny little um, Episcopal church in my town that I love. It's so great. The rector and the assistant rector, great people. I think I met them. Oh, really? At an event. Oh, good. They were way cool. Yeah, Uh, yeah, they're super cool. I mean, it's just a great group of people. Leaders. You can't be an awesome person and work in a place like that (laughs) without being awesome. (laughs) You know, honestly, (laughs) they do – I mean, I live in an upper middle class white community with lots of money, and they have taken this tiny little church, and it's probably one of I I think I I think it's one of the only growing churches in the Episcopal. Like, it's growing, um, which is you know a lot of churches are shrinking and shriveling, but theirs is 
you know, they'd taken this tiny, tiny church full of little, like young families, but also tons of little old ladies mm -hmm. who range from super militant lesbians to Trump loving mm -hmm. right wing ladies. Church ladies. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, and they do it and they manage it beautifully and they kind of wow. guide all of this That's really impressive. widely range, you know, widely diverse. Well, not, not physically diverse, but, um, <laughs> right. you know, economically or, or I mean, um, politically, politically diverse group. And they just do a really good job of kind of saying, Hey, this is hard. It's messy. We don't all agree on everything, but we can do this together. And, and I show up at like once every three months <laughs> to church, to that church. <laughs> um, and every, every weekend I'm like, I should go to church this weekend, but, um, I'm gone a lot and I just don't, I don't make it a lot. But when I do, that's when I do go to church, that's where I go. But as far as like community, I have an incredible group of really close friends who are on this journey with me and kind of have walked, you know, different stages through that deconstruction process and, and to kind of out here in the wilderness together, figuring out what it looks like to move forward and to love our neighbors and love the world and look like Jesus while we do it. So, so that, so that was, I'm going to you know kick myself for saying this, there was another favorite part of the book, <laughs> the favorite part, it wasn't just the Tums. Um, and I read this before I read the book, there was a, a thing shared online, you talk about it's not so much what we do, more about who we are when we do it. Right. And that's what, yeah. that, uh, I think that spoke to a lot of people in mm -hmm. our community, a lot of people like reshared it and liked it and one thing you mentioned is kind of some nostalgia and some hurt for the leaving the girls that you were connected to early on in the youth ministry, mm -hmm. like the small groups you had and the mm -hmm. people at your house. And mm -hmm. um, in that moment, do you feel like you were like being authentically who you were mm -hmm. like in your community and mm -hmm. those people were in your community? And that's kind of what yep. it's about. I, I mean, I, I, I was to the best of my ability. I was leading, you know, high school age girls and seeking God with them. And and, and that's the thing is part of who I am is just like kind of blatantly like me. That's always been that way. So I should say, like, getting into church and kind of discover, figuring out who I am and then leading these girls, I am an honest person. I am a truth teller. I don't have – I don't carry shame. I'm not, like, a shame-filled person. And so I've never, ever had a problem that being like, oh, here's all the mistakes I made or here's the dumb thing I did this morning. And so that's never – really held me back. And so I had a really, really great relationships and still I'm friends with many of the girls that I spent time with or, you know, that like practically moved in with me when they were teenagers. And, you know, I get like messages from them and I get their invites to their weddings. And it's just cool. I got actually an invite in the mail the other day to one of my, the, my girls, um, her ordination. She's being ordained in the Episcopal church. That's so, cool. Yeah. Super proud of her. But, um, it was definitely real. And even though I'm so over the whole like youth group and <laughs> houseboat trips and campouts and short term and missions, like, all of that. <laughs> yes, like pizza. And, I mean, well, I still have pizza, but um, I'm over that. Like it doesn't, those relationships were absolutely real and genuine and heartfelt. And I love those girls and they love me. And that was the practical magic of that moment is we all showed up and God was with us and great things happened. That seems to be the call of your book. Uh, people who want to do the work of Jesus or be the hands and feet of Jesus in the world. For you, it seems like step one, owning who you are and being able to like be yourself in the midst of whatever you're doing. And then to be connected to the people who are in your life already around you mm -hmm. and to be connected well mm -hmm. seems like the work of of Jesus or something. Or just yeah. being a person. Just humanity. Absolutely. Like just be human. Yeah, it's true. And I think, I mean, I really genuinely believe like that when Jesus was like, love your neighbor, he legitimately meant like the people to your right and left. <laughs> That's way harder. It is. I it don't is. talk to my neighbor. Like we see each other every once in a while. We look the other way. <laughs> and when you think about it, like think about when Jesus said that your neighbors were your family, your neighbors were your in-laws and your like your brothers and your sister, like your the people that lived closest to you were your huge extended family. They're like the hardest people to love. Sometimes. I mean, you guys seem tight, but you know, Cause, like, that's because like, they're the hardest people to objectify. You see them in all their glory yeah. for who they are. And they know the ups you. ups and downs. And they know mm -hmm. you. And so like the challenge of love your neighbors, I think it's so much bigger than we're willing to really like admit or grab onto. Yeah. I think I'll stick with just donating. Yeah. You know? Just write a check. I'll, right, yeah. I'll just send someone somewhere. I do that work. Well, I think yeah. that that's that's hard because I think that it's going back to that whole being yourself. But if you don't love yourself and you're not really in tune with who you are, we project. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So if we're so self-loathing, we're going to project that on other people and we're not going to be able to have those connections of loving our neighbor because we're so into ourselves and where we're at and our, not that we shouldn't be concerned with our struggles, but that mm-hmm. we should be self-aware, you know? Self-aware. That's, that's Self-awareness is probably the greatest spiritual gift <laughs> <laughs> that most people don't seem to have sometimes. I agree. It's, I think it's a hard place to get to. Yeah, it really is. Well, it's something that you wanted to make into the book. That didn't actually get in there. Is there one oh, thing that you were like, I really wish this would have made it into the book? Um, I don't know that I'm like, like there's anything I wish made it in because I think you I would had, have fought for it if you really wanted I, it. And I did. I fought for stuff that I thought needed to be there. But um, you're like, no, this milkshake story has to happen. Milkshake. I, I would have <laughs> maybe taken out. But <laughs> <laughs> actually, there was part of that um, chapter that ended up getting cut. And I think it's probably the best thing I've ever written. And it's just sitting in my, it's sitting in a folder somewhere, just about like God's purpose for us and how he's not orchestrating terrible things to happen to us so that so that we can point back to him and say god did that like it's just god's not cruel and you know like the butter milkshake was not god's idea and so i wrote this whole thing and they were like this is preachy i was like okay fine i love that that, that's a theme that's a part of your book is that it's messy and you're not just saying this is just god and not humans like it's a conglomeration of things but it was like it was just well written, and I don't think I—I I don't think most of the things that I write are well written. And I was like, oh, that was, but that was like a writer, like a writer wrote that. <laughs> they're taking it out, and they're like, we don't really want you to be a writer. Just throw shit on pages, and oh, man. but um, and then there was a story about a sex shop in my town. Like the sex shop went in, and like the, the like evangelical like pearl clutching. It was super funny, and it was when I was a brand new Christian, and I was just like, wait a second, like all the ladies in my church were having these like. I don't know what they're called. They're like these like parties. It's like a Tupperware party, but if the Tupperware is made of like dildos, right. <laughs> like it's like <laughs> like sex. Per- they're they're like intimate, you know, like things to help your marriage. And it was just like sex shop stuff that they right. were selling. And with, so, with, G- with Jesus written on the side. Exactly. I don't know. I, yeah, I don't know. It was like <laughs> Christian bookstores have everything else. Like yeah, <laughs> with I mean, verses on right, it. Why right. Why not? <laughs> why not? Why not? I don't know. But it was like, and it wasn't like Christian. It was just like in these Christian circles. Right. So they would, it was you know, baptized or whatever. Right. It was like, you'd have, you know, the, you'd get an invite for your creative moments or, you know, your, your scrapbooking. And then there'd be an invite for the, the cooking per, lady that's selling cooking shit. And then there'd be like an invite for this like secret, hey, ladies, let's get together and drink some <laughs> wine and buy sex toys. It was weird. It was super weird. But then this sex shop came into my town and people lost their minds. And I was just like, wait, what? Like, it's like, no, we do that at church. You're not allowed to right? do that. Right. But outside. what it really was was, no, 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 we do that in secret. Yeah. Online. And and a sex wow. shop is a threat to my, like, like, what if I get, what if I'm seen? So it's fine if we do these things, but right. we don't want anyone to see us. And we don't want our husbands to be, you know, quote unquote, tempted or tempted. whatever. And, and I was just like, this does not add up. Like, you <laughs> are campaigning to keep this shop out of your town because it's going to, you know, it's just this whole message of like, of like the broken sexuality in the church. And then also the hypocrisy of people who were so worried about this store being in their town, but couldn't even talk about, you know, but had like Victoria's Secret catalogs in their bathroom. Like, it was just like, I I was so confused because I was such a young Christian. But well, you know, as a man, it's nice to think about you know, all the women in the community being taught how to cook, being taught how to like right? <laughs> be pleasing in the bedroom. And, <laughs> but you got to keep that in the house because yeah, I don't want you, secret. you know, going outside of the house and doing right. that. It was such a weird thing. So, yeah, but that didn't make it. There's a lot of people that can relate to that. A lot of churches did that. I think. Oh, yeah. We had mm-hmm. to deal with that stuff going And there wasn't even a sex and... shop that got put in the town. That there was already were... one there. But oh, they, there. yeah, this was yeah, this was just like a new one. And it was in a. um it was in this really pr- – it was in a family area and it's all – now it's all – well, even then, it, there was this big objection like, oh, they're putting in a sex shop on Sutter Street and everyone's losing their minds. But like Sutter Street was also full of like bars where the cougars went. Like all these married cougars would go and like grind on college students. But they're freaking out about this shop that sells like thong underwear. It was so weird. It was just the whole thing was so weird and hypocritical and bizarre. But it was a great – eye-opening moment for me so didn't make it into the book yeah so your publisher was like you know that's the one place you went over the line yeah no actually it was just kind of like repetitive because i'd already talked about it it was sort of like we have to choose between this story and another story so we just went with the um Mm. the like church ladies and the bible study thing i liked that one yeah it was good i mean the, the book in general it did a great job of like 
encapsulating, I think, all of our experiences in terms of there's these moments that just chipped away a little bit. Mm-hmm. They're kind of like, ah, but didn't think anything of it. And then all of a sudden, oh, there's another little yep. And then eventually it gets to that place where you can't. Because I remember in one of the the chapters you were talking about, you know, this doesn't seem like a big deal, but it, ha- it happened all at once. Yep. But then it also carries the weight of all those little chipped away experiences mm-hmm. from before. And mm-hmm. those are those are heavy, difficult experiences that aren't, you know, that aren't highlighted by these catastrophic events, but mm-hmm. they're just little they, things. Yeah, they pile up. up and yeah. you said, uh, I think it's a direct quote off the top of my head. Uh, you can put up with a lot of shit if you believe you're doing it for the right reasons. Or yes. Something like that. Yeah. Anyone can. I mean, we do as human beings. We put up with a lot of a lot of shit. Like if if you think that they're you know, like we work terrible jobs to provide for our children and. I mean, women give birth to babies. It's horrible. (laughs) Why do we do this? Because you get a baby. Like, you know, the human spirit is so resilient and so um, capable. But when you when you chip away at a person's purpose, like if you you chip away at that purpose, I mean, then you just feel desperate and sad. And I think there's a lot of people in the church kind of in that space of like, I did all this stuff and it felt like I thought it was good. But then you find out that the purpose really... It, it didn't serve the purpose that you'd hoped and it just become it feels very desperate and sad, I think, for a lot of people. Because yeah. that, that rhetoric does prop up that whole idea of if I do this, I'll be fixed. Mm-hmm. And that <laughs> that hit me hard when I read the book. I was like, oh, that trying to undo that within the system, because the latter part of my time as a minister within evangelical churches, it was I had that realization and trying to like do that from within was tiring. You're wearing all these different masks while trying to encourage people not to wear any masks. Right. And you just can't. You just can't. It's exhausting. Yeah. 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 And that is that was a driving factor for me in, in becoming a missionary and selling all our stuff, dragging my poor kids to a foreign country. I just kept thinking, you know, my, my marriage was a disaster. I myself was struggling with severe depression, anxiety, all kinds of stuff. And I just kept thinking, well, no, if I do this thing, God will fix me. God will fix this marriage. God will fix, uh, you know, it'll be great. He'll provide. And that's not how it works. Mm -hmm. All the suffering will be worth it in the end. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, that's great. If I grin and bear it. Exactly. You, uh, I love that part of that that story in specific when you're talking about the the church ladies. And you're like, I could shrug off the whole stuff about mental health. I could shrug off all the stuff about this issue. But. My sleep, like oh my quiet God. time. There, there are single moms who read this book, and like that's their chapter. Oh know? God, I wrote that for moms everywhere. Any, I, I could not. I like lost my mind. Lost my mind. I think you said, uh, "I'll have quiet time with God when I'm dead." <laughs> yes, it will be so quiet. It will be so amazing. Yeah, just in this sitting in this Bible study with all these little moms, and we're all so tired. And I was, I was, I just had my third baby, and yeah, we're reading like this like how to guide for Christian wives and moms. It was so disgusting it was just like like don't let yourself go or your husband will cheat on you <laughs> it's just like okay that's a common thing spoken oh, from the pulpit god i know in, in it's such a it's probably nightmare. ghost written by driscoll <laughs> right like take care of that penis garage <laughs> i think it was a penis home oh sorry i thought it was just a garage you upgraded it to a home okay uh yeah like just you know take it and that and and the you know mental illness is just right a sin um, and I was like, oh, that's probably, that's like one of the worst right there. Mental totally. illness being a sin. Yep. And so I just kept reading like these little chapters and I'd be like, you know what? I don't agree with that. I don't think I agree with that. But it was just very quiet. Like, I don't think I, hmm, I don't know. And then it just got to this chapter about like parenting and, and quiet time. It was quiet time. And this terrible human being wrote this terrible book, told all of these young moms that, they need to get up earlier. If they're not getting their quiet time in every day, then they need to just get up earlier. And I was like, <laughs> the hell? <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm not getting up earlier. There's no way. I, I could barely, I was barely functioning, barely keeping my kids alive. And so to have some, you know, Christian authority say, oh, no, no, this is the most important thing. And then have all these women around this table, like, like nodding their heads in agreement. I was just like, wait, what? Like, we're dying. <laughs> You're killing us. We're dying. And I'm not doing that. I'm not doing quiet time. And the whole purpose or the whole, um, like, their little kitschy thing was like, oh, you can, oh, God, you can sleep when you're dead. Right. You can sleep when you're dead. That's what this bitch told, like, all these <laughs> moms with all these babies. And I was just like, no, 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 no. I'm almost dead now because I haven't slept. And that's not right. It's not right. I, my, my children need me to sleep. My, God gave me these kids. Like, I think I'm supposed to 
sleep so I can take care of them. And it was like really the first time that I expressed a, a very strong opinion in this group of ladies, the church ladies who know all things. And I was just like, you know what? No, nope. I, I can, I'll be, I'll be quiet with God when I'm dead right now. I'm going to get in my loud time because that's all I, that's my life is loud. I, th- I think people write in all the time to our show that they're navigating moments like that. They have a community they love that's well connected, good for their mm-hmm. children, good for them, mm-hmm. and they don't want to leave it. Mm-hmm. And they're putting up with messages that are just not okay with them, ideology that's not okay with them. And it all comes to like one moment and they'll have one moment where it's just over the top and then they have to find a new place. But but there are people all over the place trying to deal with their place in church yep. because they're so uncomfortable yeah. with things. Well, I didn't leave. I just had the moment and then I w- was labeled <laughs> as dangerous, <laughs> you know, because that's what happens if you disagree. Um, then people just say, oh, well, stay away. She's dangerous. So good times, right? <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who are listening, it's not just you. You're not yeah, the only you, one. You are not You're alone. You're not the only dangerous one. <laughs> I am dangerous. We're all dangerous. Well, thank you so much yeah. for agreeing to uh, do the interview. It's pleasure. been really nice to actually do one of these in person. And, Even in a cry room. Uh, I know. Yeah. This was fun. I'm actually, it was so nice to get out of my house and like hang out. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, how can we direct people to what you have going on? Well, first, um, they can buy my book. Yes. Which is a cool way to support a writer buy their book. Um, it's called The Very Worst Missionary, A Memoir or Whatever. And we shouldn't illegally download it. Um, um, maybe not. That'd be cool if you just, it's like $9 on Amazon, <laughs> you guys. Like most people, not all, most people can afford it. And if you can't, your library has it. And if they don't, they will buy it, which also helps. In yeah, I know the Sacramento County Library has it and they also have audio copies mm-hmm. and all kinds of yeah, stuff. Yeah, it's, it's out really there, cool. but it's available at everywhere the books are sold. And um, so that would be helpful. And, or just find me online theverywarsmissionary.com or social media at Jamie, the VWM. Sounds good. And we will have all that information in the show notes, including all the places you can find the book, all the links to Jamie's social media that will be at irenacast.com slash 120. 120, man. irenacast.com slash 120. Thank you again for joining us. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks. We hope you enjoyed that conversation that we had with Jamie Wright. And as promised at the top of the show, I want to let you know how you can enter to win a drawing to get a copy of her book for free, The Very Worst Missionary. So all you have to do is you go into the show notes or just go to your browser and type in irenacasa.com slash survey. And it's exactly what it sounds like. There will be a slight survey that we'd love for you to fill out. We're trying to get to know our listeners more as we begin to move forward and craft our show uh, towards all the things that you like and maybe things you don't like that we're just kind of unaware of at this point. So uh, fill out that survey. It'll ask for your email and then we'll draw a name. And then once your name has been drawn, then we will email you to get your address to send you a copy of the book. So that's irenacast.com slash survey. The last day to fill out the survey in order to qualify for the drawing will be Sunday, July 1st, 2018. That's Sunday, July 1st, 2018. And we will actually announce the winner at the top of the show next week. And uh, we will also send you an email. So we're really looking forward to getting to know our listeners a little bit better. That'll do it for us this week. Again, check the show notes, irenicast.com slash 120 for all the links and everything we mentioned. And if you'd just like to go ahead and buy a copy of her book as well, you can find out information there. Uh, so until next week, thanks for joining the conversation. Thanks for joining the conversation.